Today, before we start uh, the new material, I just want to do a few more examples of integration by substitution so that you get used to that procedure, and then we'll move on to section 5.1. So this is a continuation of section 4.5. Okay, just some examples. <coughs> okay, so for example, how about uh, the antiderivative of <coughs> of what? X cubed multiplied by x to the fourth plus seven, and then this will be to some power like three dx. Okay, so the purpose of this problem is, <coughs> so for one thing, it's to get you to use substitution, but for another thing, right, it's designed so that it almost just looks like you should algebraically multiply this out, right? You might think, I could multiply that out, but in fact, my experience is that humans actually are not very good at that, and that's one of the reasons why we made machines in the first place. <coughs> because humans are not actually good at multiplying these things out. So let's instead use substitution. Let's use substitution. So what do you think? What should you be? OK, so then u could be x to the fourth plus 7. OK, so then how about this? What if u was just x to the fourth? Would that be OK? And there would be nothing. Strictly speaking, there would be nothing wrong with that. There would be nothing wrong with that because then I could say that du dx is three uh, x to the excuse me is four x to the three. So that I could say that du divided by four is x cubed dx. So that looks that doesn't look too bad. But right, what would be even better? Yeah, to take care of the 7, too, because notice, if I make it x to the 4th plus 7, x to the 4th plus 7, then I take care, then the 7 also goes away, and all of this work remains the same. So can you see that one of the principles in choosing u is to, is to in a sense, gobble up as many symbols as possible? Right? You could have said x to the 4, that would have been acceptable. But it's even better to say x to the 4 plus 7. It's even better. It's more to your advantage. Okay, so then, if we do that, then this becomes, right, I'll rewrite this, I'll rewrite this antiderivative just slightly to make, make sure everyone, uh, excuse me, just slightly to make sure that everyone sees what's going on here. Okay, so then, now x to the 4 plus 7, that gets replaced that gets replaced by u, so this is u to the 3. And x cubed dx, that gets replaced with du over 4. Okay, so does everybody see how this substitution occurred? Okay. <coughs> so then this will be 1 fourth, 1 fourth, the antiderivative of u cubed du. And so now, is this one of the antiderivatives you know? Sure it is, right? So this is just the power rule. So 1 fourth multiplied by u to the 4 divided by 4 plus some unknown constant. And then this isn't the answer because why? Ne yes, it needs to be in terms of x. So then altogether, I'll say something like 1 over 16 and then uh, x to the 4 plus 7 to the 4 plus a constant. So any question about this example? Any question about it? OK, so now let's do one with some trig functions, and then we need to do uh, a different kind. So how about, how about something like, oh, that looks beautiful. So then let's do this one. The antiderivative of tangent of 2x raised to the 4 multiplied by secant of 2x squared dx. Mm, 
now it's not so clear what you should be. Hmm. So let's just try a stab in the dark. How about I try that you, instead of just sitting here wondering, wondering, wondering what I should do, let's just try anything. So how about you as the secant of 2x? I'll try that. So then if I try that, then du dx, well, what's the derivative of secant? The derivative of secant is secant of x, or secant of whatever, tangent of whatever, multiplied by the derivative, so then multiplied by 2. So why, why does this 2 come up? The chain rule. Okay, so then altogether du would be, du would be secant of 2x tangent of 2x multiplied by 2 dx. So let's see, did we get it? Let's think here. So then if I say u is secant, that takes up one of the secants. Okay, so how many secants are there? There's two of them, right, in, in the product. So here's this u will take care of one of the secants. du will take care of the other secant. So that's good. Right, so I took care of both secants. And du takes care of one of the tangents. But how many tangents are there? Four, right? So then in a sense, there are three unaccounted for tangents. So then could this be the right way to go? No, probably not the right way to go. So that's OK. That's OK. You know, a little bit of life wasted and irrecoverable now, but, but that's OK. So let's try something else. What do you think? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try tangent of 2x. Tangent of 2x. Okay, so then now, if I try that, then du, du dx, what's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared, right? So then this will be secant of 2x squared and then multiplied by two for the chain rule. Multiplied by two for the chain rule. Then I can say that du, du is secant of 2x squared dx, and then I'll put the division by 2 over here. So how does that look? That's looking pretty good, right? Because if I do that, then this part, right, the tangent, right, this will become u to the 4, right, u to the 4, and this part right here, what will this become, the green part? du over 2. Ah, so that's, that's probably what the question maker had in mind. Okay, so then if we do that, then this becomes the antiderivative of u to the 4 multiplied by du over 2. Okay, and so now is this one of the antiderivatives you know? Yes, so I'll leave it, I'll just <coughs> leave it and leave the rest to your imagination. Okay, so any question about this example? question about this example. Okay, so one other kind that is interesting is how about this one? How about the antiderivative of, yes, of something like x over the square root of 2x plus 1, the x? Yes. How far? To right here? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, so how about this one? Hmm, how about this one? So this one, this kind of antiderivative is an especially good example of that phenomenon that I was trying to tell you about before where good students try to sit here and don't write anything down and they just don't try anything and then submit a blank response. Okay, so then let's just try anything, right? So if u is 2x plus 1, then du, du would be 2dx. So I could say that du over 2 is dx. Okay, and that's looking kind of bleak because, <laughs> because right here I have 2x plus 1. Right? 2x plus 1, I can replace that with what? 
with you. So that would be okay. And then uh, I have this other piece, dx. I could replace that with du over 2. Right? That would be okay. But what part do I not have? I don't have anything to replace x with. Or do I? Probably, right? Because the instructor is asking, or do I? <laughs> so, then, <laughs> so then how? How can I figure out what x is? Ah, right, I can, take this, I can take this expression right here and solve for x. I can take that expression right there and solve for x. And then I can say that, well, OK, u minus 1 is equal to 2x, so that u minus 1 over 2 is equal to x. So then now do I have enough things to replace all x things with u things? Yes, now I have enough. <coughs> now I have enough things. So this kind of procedure is called a shift substitution. It's called a shift because what's happening is, is, is essentially you're taking the coordinate, the coordinate system and shifting it a little bit so that the square root term in the denominator becomes more simple after a shift. OK, so then now let's do this. So if we were to do this, then you would get u minus 1 over 2 in the numerator. <coughs> and in the denominator, you would get the square root of u. And then dx, we said, would become du over 2. So this is division by 2, and this is division by 2. So altogether, I'm going to factor out division by 4, multiplication by 1 fourth. So 1 fourth antiderivative u minus 1 over the square root of u. And at this point, you might say, I'm not really sure this looks any better than it did before. <laughs> but it actually is. So then now what? No, we, can't, we don't want to do that yet. Sorry? Ah, this can be algebraically simplified now, right? So then this, I can say, is u over the square root of u. Uh, minus 1 over the square root of u du. And so then now this is 1 fourth the antiderivative of, well, u divided by the square root of u, that's the square root of u, which I'll write, I'll write as u to the 1 half. Okay, and then 1 over the square root of u, well, that's u to what fractional exponent? u to the negative 1 half. Right, so then now you have you have the antiderivative of the difference of two things. Can you compute the antiderivative of u to the 1 half? Yes. Can you compute the antiderivative of u to the negative 1 half? Yes. So now you should be able to take the, the question from here. OK, so any question about this kind of thing? This kind of example. OK, so then the last thing, a couple examples that I want to look at is using the integration with is using substitution with integration. That is to say, when you have limits. OK, so as an example, as an example, how about mm, this one? Oh, what's happening to the screen? OK, so then the, the antiderivative of, how about negative 2 to 4? of x squared multiplied by x cubed plus 8 squared dx. <coughs> OK. So then now, what the purpose of this example is all previous substitution examples with antiderivatives were just antiderivatives. They were not integrals. So here we have an integral, which means you, you need to remember the connection between, the fu between integration anti-differentiation, and all of this. Right, the fundamental theorem of calculus says to compute an integral, you compute an antiderivative, and then you plug in once, you plug in twice, and then you subtract. Right, so does everybody remember this? Okay. So then, in order to proceed, we will need to do a substitution. So without delay, I'll just say that the correct substitution is x cubed plus, uh, is that u is x cubed plus 8. After a brief consideration, you'll determine that du over 3 is equal to x squared dx 
the u over 3 is equal to x squared dx. Okay, so then now uh, I'll say the following, which is correct, but is on the verge of being incorrect. Okay, so then this is the integral from negative 2 to 4 of uh, what? u squared and then multiplied by du over 3. Okay, so strictly speaking, strictly speaking, this is still a correct statement, but it's on the verge of being incorrect. Okay, so then I'll say that this is one-third, the integral from negative 2 to 4 of u squared du. Still correct, but on the verge of being incorrect. <coughs> so then now one-third, the antiderivative of u squared is u cubed over 3. And then because this is an integral, it will be from negative 2 to 4, evaluated like so. So this is still correct, but on the, ver on the verge of being incorrect. So now I'll finally make the mistake. Okay. So then, well, I'll, okay, so I'll do it like this. So one more, so it's simplified. u cubed over 9, evaluated from negative 2 to 4. Okay, so now I'll make the mistake. Okay, so then this should be, this should be 4 cubed over 9 and then minus negative 2 cubed over 9. And now the last line is emphatically not correct. So what's happened here? Ah, right? So then, now, this was an integral. This was an integral of this expression in x from this x value to this x value. Right? From this x value to this x value. So then, this is from x is negative 2 to x is 4. And this is from x is uh, negative 2 to x is 4, and blah, 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 blah. I can keep writing these x equal, these x equal to remind me of what's happening here. And so if I carry these x equals through the computation, you can see what finally happened. Right? I had limits, negative 2 and 4, in terms of x. And then finally, I plugged them into an expression that was in terms of u. Ah, so you can see where the error happened. Okay, so then, <coughs> one thing you can do, so here, this, oops, this step is wrong. Okay, so then, <coughs> you can say that, well, instead, I'll say that this is, uh, what, x cubed plus 8. So then this will be x cubed plus 8 cubed over 9 evaluated from negative 2 to 4. And now you can plug in. Okay, now you can plug in. So this would be some, some really big number, and I don't have a calculator with me. So then I'll just write it down like this. Uh, 4 cubed plus 8 cubed over 9 minus <coughs> negative 2 cubed plus 8 cubed over 9. Okay, and then whatever that numerically comes out to be is, is the answer. So any question about this example? Where did the x squared go? Yes. OK, so then, if I, rewrite, if I rewrite this as this antiderivative as so, so then I'll write it like this. So then, x cubed plus 8 right, is this. It became u. Right, so this red box became that red box. Okay, so then now this other stuff x squared dx x squared dx became du over 3. Other questions? Okay, so then now this is one way to solve this, to solve this type of question. Okay, so then it sort of goes like this. You have, a, you have a, an integral you wish to compute. You go through the substitution pr procedure for antiderivatives. You compute, the, you compute the antiderivative in terms of the new substituted symbol that you called u. And then you resubstitute back into x and never do the limits change. Right? You don't ever change the limits. Okay? That is to say the limits are always in terms of the symbol x. 
So then another way to proceed, and this is really, in my experience, just a matter of taste. Okay, some students prefer the procedure that I've written on the left. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going to solve the problem again in the right column. Okay, except I'm going to do it slightly differently. So then this is, I'll copy the problem from negative 2 to 4 of x squared multiplied by x cubed plus 8 dx, uh, x cubed plus 8 squared dx, and then I'll say that u is x cubed plus 8, and then s still that du over 3 is x squared dx. So then, uh, yeah, x squared dx. So that so far there's no difference between these two. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the limits. Okay, that is to say that, well, what, is, what, is, what are the new limits in terms of the new symbol u, right? The old symbol was x, and the old limits are in terms of x. So then let's make new limits. So then specifically, u evaluated at negative 2. What do you get if you plug in negative 2? You get 0, right? You get 0 because that is negative 2 cubed plus 8. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8 plus 8. That's 0. Okay, and then u, what if you plug in 4? If you plug in 4, well, that's 4 cubed plus 8. Well, 4 cubed is 64 plus 8 is 72. So then now we'll do the substitution. Now we'll do the substitution and with new limits, right? This will be from 0 to 72 of u squared du over 3. Okay, and now the procedure goes as it usually does, right? So then after some considerations, 1 ninth u cubed evaluated from 0 to 72. Okay, so then this will be 1 ninth. Uh, let's, say it, let's say it like this. It will be 72 cubed over 9 minus 0 cubed over 9. Okay, so then these two procedures have the exact same, the exact same result. Okay, so then this procedure is the difference, okay, so on the left, right, you never change the limits. On the right, you say, well, I'm going to change the symbols from x to u, and I'm also going to change the limits from in terms of x to in terms of u. Okay, so then either way is acceptable. You just have to do one or the other. So any question about this example? Okay, so then let's do one more of these and then we can move on to something else. <coughs> yeah, that'll be good. Okay, so for example, for example, the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to 1 of x times the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. So please do this one quickly. Okay, so then in the interest of moving along in expediency, I'll tell you that the correct substitution will be the thing under the square root. In fact, it's not always the case, but very frequently it is the case that you want u to be is whatever is under the square root. Square roots are notoriously difficult to deal with when you're using antiderivatives. And if somehow you can make everything under the square root a single symbol, then, then you're in good shape. If you cannot, then you have to use all kinds of arcane techniques that we'll go over, unfortunately, later in the semester. Okay, so then if you do that, then you will determine that du divided by negative 2 is equal to x dx. Okay,
Okay, so then with that, it's enough. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and substitute the limits. You don't have to substitute the limits, but I'm going to do it. So then u evaluated at 0, u evaluated at 0 is 1, and u evaluated at 1 is what? 0. Okay. So then, this becomes something like this. So then you get the square root of u, and then du over negative 2. And now the question is, is which limit goes where? Right? What, what is what? Right. 1 is on the bottom, and then 0 is on the top. Because 0 became 1, so the 1 that was on the bottom became 1. And 1 is on the top, and u of 1 is 0. Ha, but wait a minute, this is sort of disturbing to look at, right? So then all the time you're used to looking at integrals, and look at these limits. What's kind of telling you is, what is strange about this? They're like in the reverse order that you're accustomed to thinking of, right? You're used to, you know, if it's the integral from A to B, you're accustomed to B being greater than A. Okay, but that's not necessary at all. Nowhere is that necessary in the definition of the integral. Okay. <laughs> So then now, I want to point out something. So then first off, I can say that I can factor out 1 over negative 2, and then the integral from 1 to 0 of the square root of u, du. And now I want to do something. I want to go ahead and switch these to the normal order, because maybe that's psychologically pleasing. What happens when you switch the order of the limits in an integral? Ah, it changes the SIGN, right? So then specifically, it's, this is 1 over negative 2 multiplied by negative the integral from 0 to 1, the square root of u, du. Ah, and so now the negatives, they cancel. So then this is 1 half the integral, and I'll rewrite the square root of u as u to the 1 half, du. And then this is from 0 to 1. Okay, so any question about how we arrived here? Okay. So then I'll go ahead and finish this one out. So this is what? 1 half u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves evaluated from 0 to 1. So this division by 3 halves is the same as multiplication by 2 thirds. So 2 thirds multiplied by 1 half is 1 third. So this is 1 third u to the 3 halves evaluated evaluated from 0 to 1. So this is what? 1 third multiplied by 1 to the 3 halves minus 1 third multiplied by 0 to the 3 halves. Fortunately, 0 to the 3 halves and 1 to the 3 halves are both pretty easy. Okay, so then altogether, what is the result? 1 third. Okay, so any question about this? <coughs> yes? So, so yes, I mean, basically, so, somewhere the sign change, if you don't switch the order, somewhere the sign change will happen. If you hadn't changed the order of integration from 1 to 0 into 0 to 1, then what you would have gotten is 0 minus negative 1 third, okay, which would be 1 third. So it doesn't make any difference, it doesn't make any difference where you pay the price. <laughs> so I just happen to pay it in this position. Right, from here to here, or from here to here, I mean to say, because I knew that that would be the easiest place to pay the price. So it would have been arithmetically a little bit more distracting to do it down here. Other questions? Ah, instead of doing this, yeah, so then if you change the limits, you have, you have to either change from u back to x, or you have to change the limits in terms of x to in terms of u. You have to make one of those two changes. Whichever, whichever one you prefer is up to you. So then, no, you wouldn't have had to, 
you wouldn't have the limits would have still been zero to one if you had never changed them from x's to u and then you wouldn't have had the thought to switch them yeah it, it occurs because <clears throat> the reason why it occurs is because uh, of this expression, right? U is 1 minus x squared. And so then the nature of the substitution is causing the order of the limits to change. So that's the whole purpose of this question, really. That's why I selected it, because I wanted the limits to change from, from you know, A to B with A greater than B to C to D with C greater than D. <coughs> I wanted it to be that way. Other questions? Okay, great. So then now, now we need to move on to something else. So this is section 5.1. And it is called the natural, or at least this is what the book calls it, the natural logarithmic function. I sort of take offense a little bit to that name, <laughs> really, because to a mathematician there isn't, you know, the word natural is an adjective which is trying to say specifically I'm talking about this one. But really to a mathematician there's only one log at all. So then this comes up because of the following. Okay, this is the, the reason why we are in this position is as follows. So you have the following rule called the power rule. So the antiderivative of x to the n dx is equal to x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus some unknown constant. But there is one caveat. This works for all values of n, except what? Except n is negative 1. Right, so then before today, before today, right, so then this antiderivative, which you could rewrite as the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, right, you had no, no means to compute it. Right? So then this was unknown. Okay, so then that's kind of weird. It's kind of weird <laughs> that the power rule works for every value of n except this one value of n. Okay, so then so then what we're going to do is we're going to single out this case and talk about it a lot today for the rest of the lecture. So then, this is the definition of the log. Log of x. Okay. So then I will make attempts to pronounce this as natural log. So, so this is two letters, L and then N. Right, L, N. So the natural log of x is defined as follows. It is the integral from 1 to x of the expression 1 over t dt. Okay. This, of course, is only defined for x's which are positive. So now. You've seen logs before, right? But if you've s almost surely your experience of logs is not in, not with the natural log, but the log of another base, like log base what? 10, right? So then you might wonder, you know, in basically all of human discourse, you know, science, math, and whatever, almost all of it, we, we always use base 10. And why do we always use base 10? Because what? We like 10, but why do we like 10 so much? 10 fingers, right? Is there any good mathematical reason to choose 10? No, right? Actually, 10 is a very poor base, right? It would be much better if we, if we had 12 fingers or something like that mathematically, okay? But, you know, we turned out to have 10, whatever, it's fine, okay? So then there is nothing special about 10 or log base 10 or anything like that. In fact, as far as mathematics and nature is concerned, this is the log, right? In the log base 10 that you're so accustomed to, 10 is just an artifact of humans having 10 fingers, okay? Similarly, another log that is quite popular is log base 2. Log base 2 is quite popular, and that's mostly because of the considerations of computer science. And what am I talking about here? Binary, right? Right, so then on your computer, right, you still information is stored by 
charging little transistors to a high voltage or a low voltage, and this is interpreted to be zero or one. Right? So then there's two possible states. So log base two is quite important also, as far as humans are concerned. So then this is the log. Okay, so then I'll say the log. <coughs> Okay, so any question about it? So then I have a question for you. I have a question for you. In that case, please tell me, what is the derivative of the log of x? Ah, so well, so then let's say that, well, I could compute the derivative and replace the definition replace log with its definition, that is the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. Ah, so I can see that I'm computing the derivative with respect to x of an integral that has x in one of its limits, so then I'm going to use what here? The, the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? The fundamental theorem of calculus, and this is going to tell me that the derivative is what? 1 over x. Great. Okay. So then now, between the power rule, right, the antiderivative of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant, and the definition of the natural log function, you now have a means to compute the antiderivative of x to the n dx for any x at all. Okay, so any question about, about this? So now let's look at the geometry, <coughs> some of the geometric properties. So then, we have this log of x function, which is equal to the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. Okay, now, 1 over t, uh, let's assume for a moment, let's assume for a moment that x is greater than 1. Okay, if we assume for a moment that x is greater than 1, then this is the integral of 1 over t. So then how about the SIGN of 1 over t between 1 and x if x is greater than 1? What's its SIGN? Positive, right? It's positive. In fact, the SIGN of 1 over t is positive any time that uh, t is positive. Okay, so then what that means is I can say, okay, I'm going to draw 1 over t dt. Or just 1 over t, that is to say. So then the graph, the graph of 1 over t looks like this. And so this is the t-axis, and this is one over the graph of 1 over t. Okay, so then now if I say that this is, this is, This is t is equal to 1. And this other one here is t is equal to x. Then please tell me what my picture has to do with the natural log function. Please tell me what my picture has to do with the natural log function. Right, the value of the natural log of x is this area. So what the natural log of x is, is the accumulation of the area between 1 and x under the function 1 over t. It's the accumulation of all that area. So now I have a question for you. I have a question for you. What if, what if I uh, take this right fence post, x, and I make it bigger? I, make it, I move it further to the right. What would you say about the area? I get more area. Right? If I move this, you know, this one is always fixed at 1. If I move this one to the right, if I move this one to the right, then I get more area. So what does that tell me about log as a function? Log is increasing. 
log has to be an increasing function because as I increase x geometrically, what that means is that I'm moving this fence post to the right, so I'm accumulating more area, and log of x is that area. So log of x is an increasing function. <coughs> okay, so then that's the first comment. Log of x is increasing. Of course, this is somewhat, uh, th that's a geometric way to see that log of x is increasing. You could have seen this in another way. You could have seen this in another way. You could have said that, well, what's the derivative of the log of x? It is 1 over x. And the domain of log of x is positive values of x. So then what is the SIGN of the derivative of the log of x? Positive. For all, it's always positive. So then what if you, if I give you a function and its derivative is always positive, what does that tell you? That it's increasing. Okay, wonderful. So any question about that? <coughs> okay. So now I have another question for you. What about, let's consider, what would this be? the log of 1. Please someone explain what it, what it means in this picture. Right, so that would, be, that would be if I take this right fence post x and I move it all the way to coincide with 1. And so then in my picture, how much area would be uh, would be present if I move this fence post all the way until the two fence posts coincide. How much area is in there? None, right? None at all. So then what is the log of 1? It's 0. The log of 1 is 0. Okay, so then that's a geometric understanding. You could have seen that also by saying that, well, the log of 1 by definition has to be the integral from 1 to 1 of 1 over t dt. And we already said that if you integrate from a to a any function whatsoever, then the answer is zero. Okay, wonderful. So any question about this one? <coughs> any question about this one? Okay, so then now, you know, logs are quite important. They're, they're quite important mathematically. And here is one of the reasons why they are so important is you have this. The log of a, b, Right, so then, I have two numbers, a and b, and I compute their product, a, b. And then compute the log. Okay, so then log, the log function does what? I can say that this, I can write a different expression on the right-hand side, what? The log of a plus the log of b. And that's kind of weird. Really, because how, what, is that, <laughs> what does that have to do with this picture? Right? How, does, how does log take a product and turn it into a sum like that? Hmm. So then the way we're going to see this <coughs> is as follows. Okay, so let's show that this is in fact the case. So then, we have, how about, uh, I'll consider two different, uh, two different functions. Let's consider the log of x and the log of ax for some a which is positive. They will consider two different functions. So then, the in the first case, what is the derivative of the log of x? Well, this will be the fourth or fifth time I've written it down, right? It, it is 1 over x. Okay, so then now, how about, please tell me, what is the derivative? What is the derivative of the log of a multiplied by x? <coughs> now that's an interesting question, right? That's an interesting question because now we have to use, uh, in a sense, the definition, right? The definition. So then this would be the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 1 to ax 
of 1 over t dt. So now that we've done this, we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and say that, all right, this will be equal to, this will be equal to 1 over ax, okay, 1 over ax, but then now what else will appear? A will appear because, you, because of the chain rule, right? multiplied by a, this multiplication by a occurs due to the chain rule, okay, and then minus zero. So then, because we said that a was some positive, a was some uh, positive value, then I have one over ax multiplied by a, so this is equal to what? One over x, and that, that should be a little bit disturbing to you. Right, so for example, what is this saying? This is saying that the derivative, the derivative of the log of 7x is, is 1 over x. The derivative of the log, <laughs> the derivative of the log of 5x is 1 over x. Ha, huh, so that's pretty disturbing, right? Okay, so then the derivative of this 7 apparently is having no action at all on the derivative, and this 5 is apparently having no action at all on the derivative. Okay, so then now I have two functions, two different functions, log of x and log of ax, okay, and they both have the same derivative. They both have the same derivative. So then if I have two functions that have the same derivative, and that means that they have the same, that 1 over x has, <coughs> excuse me, that means that according to the mean value theorem and the other considerations we made, what is the difference between these two functions? A constant, right? The difference between these two functions is at most a constant. So then what this is saying is that the log of ax is equal to the log of x plus some unknown constant c. Okay, and this has to be true for all x. It, can, it, it cannot matter what value of x, right? It has to work for all x. In particular, it means for, for all x in the domain of log. So then, this means that it's true for x is 1. And if it's true for x is 1, then I can plug in x is 1. So what this is saying is that the log of x, uh, excuse me, the log of a times 1 is equal to the log of 1 plus a constant. So I plugged in x is 1. A times 1, well, that's just A. So the log of A is equal to, we already said what the log of 1 is. What's the log of 1? It's 0, so then plus C. So then we have figured out what the C is. The C is the log, C is the log of A. So what is that telling you? Combining these tells you that the log of ax is equal to the log of x plus c, but we just determined that c is the log of a, so plus the log of a. And this is a demonstration that shows you that the log of x does has this property. Okay, it has the property of turning product into sum. <coughs> okay, so then now, there are several other very important properties of logs that I'm going to write down, but I'm not going to show you because they're almost exactly like this. Okay, so what was the previous number? Three? So now I'm on four. Okay, so then similarly, the log of A over B is what? It is the log of A minus the log of B. Okay, now you could show this using the integral definition of log, and it's almost exactly the same procedure as I did before. Okay, five. What does log do with a to the b? It becomes b multiplied by the log of a. Okay, and all of these things together, all of these things together, the last three properties, three, four, and five, are the, algebra are the important algebraic properties of logs. So then now, mm, now that we have the advent of modern computers and calculators and things like this, logs are less important to everyday people. Okay, but once upon a time, logs were exceedingly important to, to a lot of people. And I'll tell you this one example, and then that can be the end. So then, 
probably most of you have heard of Apollo 13. Right? Apollo 13 was a moon mission. Right? NASA was sending astronauts out to the moon. They were going to try and land, but there was a serious problem because one of their oxygen tanks exploded while they were out in space. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Right? There's nothing between you. You know, there's just a few layers of thin sheet metal between you and vacuum. And then you have one of your oxygen tanks explode. That must have been an interesting experience. At any rate, right, the engineers, NASA engineers, were trying to figure out, how are we going to get these astronauts? Okay, they've got to go around the moon and come all the way back to Earth and land. And they didn't have computers, right? They, they weren't... Com doing these computations with computers, they were doing computations by hand. And if you ever watch like the Apollo 13 drama with, uh, with Tom Hanks, or if you watch actual footage of what was happening because the actual footage is necessary, you'll see some engineering guys that look mostly like I do with a white shirt and lots of pins in their pockets. And they're not using, they're not using a computer. They're using this, this device, right? And they're going like this very quickly and looking at things and writing things down and doing this kind of thing. What's that device? A slide rule, right? I'm surprised anyone knows its name, a slide rule. So what is the slide rule doing? What is the slide rule doing? It's doing this right here. And property number three above. So then, because what happens is, is to, to solve the differential equations required to get the astronauts back onto the planet requires lots and lots of products. And it simply is faster it's faster, instead of computing the products of numbers, it's much faster to compute the log of those two numbers and then add those two logs together and then figure out what the original number was. It's much faster. <laughs> so then, logs were so important. Logs are what saved the Apollo 13 mission. If it wasn't for that, they would have just probably impacted into the moon or been destroyed by the atmosphere upon re-entry. So, let's hear it for logs. Okay, see you on Friday. <laughs>